search the world And it could have failed me Man's empty praise Treasures that fade Are never enough And you came along Treasures that fade are never enough.
so good to you. I want you just to lift a shout of praise because there's nothing better, nothing sweeter, nothing better than this. Oh, nothing better, nothing better than you. Oh, nothing better, nothing better. Oh, and there's no And there's nothing better. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Oh, nothing is better than you. Oh, nothing is better.
with the plan of what's happening with your children and the generations before you, after you, and side to side. And what I was actually seeing the Father do was as you are prophesying over yourself, you're coming into agreement and you're actually opening the portals of heaven in agreement with what the Spirit is doing over your generations. He is faithful through the generations. And when you're contending for a child or a loved one, sometimes there's that space that feels like, how long, Lord? How much longer? And what we actually need to be declaring is you're faithful to the generations. You are faithful to the generations. You do not fail. You are the God who sees to it. You are the one who completes what you have begun. So I just want to speak to every heart that has been praying and standing for another heart. And I want us to declare this verse again. And I want you to actually just receive that truth that he is faithful to the generations, that he will never fail, and that what you have been praying and waiting to see heaven do will come to pass. It won't be in your timing. <laughs> but it will come to pass because he is faithful to complete what he has begun. So Christ is my firm foundation. You're the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause you've never let me faithful through the generations so why would you fail now you won't you won't you won't you never fail you never stop pursuing you never fail us in, especially over the last four and a half years, 
is has really been about understanding the times. Like the sons of Issachar, they understood the times and, and were able to be a voice to Israel in really unsure times. And many of us can testify that the last four years has been filled with a lot of unsurety and a lot of confusion, a lot of frustration, a lot of, you know, I know my life has has constantly been barraged by um, thoughts or perceptions or perspectives that I see that I don't like, especially in um, my state and my nation. But one of the things that the Lord has spoke to us is out of Hebrews 12, where it talks about all things are going to shake so that only unshakable things remain. That's been a that's been a scripture the Lord has brought back time and time again over the last four and a half years. And everything that we see going on, we see the shaking. All world systems are shaking. All powers are shaking. All areas of influence are shaking. Everything is shaking. And many of us in our own personal life have experienced shakings as well. That our faith has has been exercised um, as a gift from the Lord and we've been walking in an understanding of the times and many of us have felt the pressure, Holly and I testified to that last week of just feeling the pressure and learning how to actually get excited about feeling pressure because there was a lot of my life where I actually resisted and I pushed away from the pressure because it feels uncomfortable it feels like something we're not supposed to be having. But the reality is, is is that in that pressing, in that pressure, in the shaking, in those things is actually how we grow. It's actually the place that gives us permission to be transformed, to come out of mindsets, to come out of ideas, to come out of perceptions that we've been holding, that have been hindering our relationship with God. They've been hindering our personal growth. They've been hindering our ability to receive love. They've been they've been barriers to breakthrough for us. How many of you want breakthrough? Yes. Whether that's relationally, financially, whatever it is. So we all want that. I want you to understand what I now understand is that that breakthrough only comes through pressure. It only comes through the trial. It's only through that we come out on the other side experiencing wholeness, experiencing that perfection that God is working out in us. It's on the other side we understand the nature of God's promises. And so, you know, this has been something culturally that we have been embracing as a forever family is understanding, hey, we're all on a journey. We're, we're all experiencing different difficulties. We're all in this together and we're and we're declaring together we're we're standing with one another we're encouraging one another we're we're putting first things first which is one of the words that I that I spoke last week was just making first things first and and so in this thing of shaking that we're in there's a couple things that I want us to know and some things that I just want us to understand as a family and so we understand, okay, there's, uh, we're not political, but we know there's an election in a couple days. First of all, we know that Donald Trump is not the savior of America. Jesus That's is. Right. We own that Kamala Harris is not the enemy of America. Okay. So, right. so we're, we're, we're not going to take sides in that matter. Right. Okay. So if you choose to vote, um, we choose to vote. And we choose to vote in line with the things that would match God's heart, God's principles, God's, God's direction that he has. We would vote for relationality. And it doesn't look like either side is very relational. And I understand that. So, But we allow the conviction of the Holy Spirit to lead each person. Because we're, we're not trying to tell you, oh, you know, Donald Trump is the, Trump, is the president God chose. Okay? We're not... We're not going to go there. But here's what I want you to understand. I want you to understand that uh, everything that we're going through, this election and everything, is another process of shaking. And we're not done shaking. 
Many of you have understood if you're watching, I don't watch media. I'm not huge on even any kind of media, whether it be news or newspapers or social media. There's, But the Lord brings us information as we need it. And there's been a radical shaking around even areas of like the music industry in Hollywood. And it's, it's becoming very blatantly clear of some of the darkness that's been right underneath our noses that we have not been aware of simply because we're just living a nice, comfortable Christian whatever. So here's what I want us to understand. The p- purpose of the shaking is on a personal level is for the growth and the refining and the strengthening and the promise of God being fulfilled in our life. But there's also corporate and, and national shaking that's happening. And it's, it's for the purpose of darkness to be exposed. Yeah. And, and we, we can look out and we can say, oh my gosh, the darkness is getting darker. Or we can look at it from the, from perichoresis and say, no, the light's just shining brighter. And therefore the darkness is being revealed. Okay. And so we, we want to partner with what is of light and we want to partner with what is of love. And so here's what I want you guys to know. We are, we, we believe that the kingdom of God is always, uh, is always moving forward. Can you say amen to that? Okay. So we are not those waiting for a really terrible time when the darkness is going to rise up and overthrow Jesus. That ain't happening. It ain't happening. Okay. So we're not waiting for a tribulation. We're not waiting for a rapture. We're not waiting for any of those things because they weren't a part of the life or message of Jesus Christ. And ultimately, those kind of mindsets are defeating and purpose of the gospel. The gospel is an advancing gospel. It's a gospel that moves us from faith to faith, to strength to strength, to victory to victory, to glory to glory. So this is an always, it says, to the end of his kingdom and his government, there are... Uh, excuse me, to his government and and um, his rulership, there will be no end. So his government that's been established, there is no end. What is the government of God? It's the kingdom, it's family, it's relationship, it's love, okay? So we're actually moving in that direction. In the shaking process, though, there's gonna, there could be some things, like we all know what it was like when there were fires all around and when there was, when there was uh, uh, riots and things happening. Depending on how things move forward, here's what we want you to know as part of the family at Faith Foundry. As part of the family at Faith Foundry, if for some reason anything happens, like if the power grid goes out or anything like that, just know this building will be open and we will be here. We will we will still be we'll still be doing daily worship and we'll do be doing all the things that we've always done. But as a place for, if you don't know what to do, if you're struggling, if you're feeling afraid, if you're not sure where to put your feet, if you're not, just know that you can come back to the building here and we, the Holy Spirit is going to tell us everything that we need, show us everything that we need to know. So we don't have to be afraid of any of this. We don't, we don't have to be in dread of anything that might happen. And I'm, I will tell you that there's been, there's been well over 100,000 people that have been praying for the last 90 days, um, starting from my birthday. From my birthday, which was August 8th, to election day was 90 days, exactly. And there's been over 100,000 intercessors. They don't even know the number really, but we know it's over 100,000 intercessors that have been praying every day at 414. And I've been a part of, Holly and I have been a part of that. So, um, we already know that plans and schemes of the enemy have been thrown thwarted, and we have already heard testimonies of of how that has not just for America, but for Israel and for the world. There's been there's been things that have been come to nothing, and 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 ideas and plans that have been destroyed that were plans of the enemy. And so we're going to continue to pray and continue to seek the Lord and how He would have us pray and intercede for our nation. But here's the thing: is we know that the thing that is going to actually shift our region, shift our state, shift our nation is going to be the individual heart being led by the Holy Spirit. 
okay? And when a company of people will choose to do life together and choose to submit and yield to one another and love one another and care for one another and serve one another and encourage one another and uphold one another, that's what changes cities and regions. And then we become, we become what Jesus says we are, the light in the darkness. We become the city on a hill. We become the, the force that darkness cannot stand against. This is the purpose and destiny of the church. Okay, The church that Jesus is building advances and it storms the gates of hell and advances through those things because though it can't nothing can withstand it. Nothing can withstand it. So I'm only feeling this in the Holy Spirit just to share with you. Some of you might be like, man, I don't know what's going on. I, I feel all this tension. I feel all this pressure. I feel all So just be one of those people that understands the signs of the times and knows and is. And the whole thing of us been, we've spent so much time this year talking about the realities of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God living inside of us, bringing us into the reality of their oneness, bringing us into the reality of their truth, of their life. And if we will begin to continue to meditate and enter into that, that unbroken conversation with the Trinity, we will know what we need to know when we need to know it. And we will have what we need when we, when we need to have it. And, and we don't need to be those people that are afraid. And if you feel afraid, go and read Psalm 91 out loud over yourself and just reaffirm yourself of who you are and where you are and what is yours. And, and, and we're in the kingdom of light. We've already been translated. We've already been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You're not in any other kingdom. You're not in the kingdom of America. Okay? You're in the kingdom of God. You're in the kingdom of light. You're not in the kingdom of your of me, myself, and I, and, if, and it's, it's got to be me, and I've got to work harder. That's not the kingdom you're in. You're in the kingdom of the Son of God who knows his Father and has no thought to any want or need. Think about that for a second for your own life and for your own heart. And I want us to take some time right now in our offering time, and I want us to come into a place of assurance that if there's been a thought of fear that you've had, if there's been a thought of doubt, if there's been if there's been questions and confusions and and you're not sure where to stand, you're not sure how to how to handle what's going on, I want to encourage us all to bring an offering to the Lord uh, of uh, any insecurity, any fear, any worry, any doubt, any any weariness and and feeling overwhelmed and tired and present that to the Lord as an offering today. And in exchange, take up the confident hope that we have in the Holy Spirit, in the life of Christ inside of us, knowing that we are only moving forward, that we are only in an advancing kingdom, that there is no power that darkness has that has not already been overcome by the kingdom of light. Does everybody hear in me this morning? Are we? Okay. So in our, in our offering time today, in our worship time, I want us to move ourselves emotionally, move ourselves with our thought life, move ourselves with, with some of the things, maybe even relationally that we've been struggling with, and let's move our hearts into the place of response to the life of God inside of us. Amen? Amen. Amen, amen and amen and amen. Lord, I just want to say thank you. Father, we know that you are a good God and we fully put our trust and confidence in you because you have always been and always will be faithful. You are faithful to the generations. We recognize that you have brought us into your generational blessing that lasts for thousands of generations. That the curse has been broken and the one who ends the curse in our life is now living inside of us. The parakletos the comforter, the divine encourager. And we just say yes to the movement of your heart in us right now. Father, that you would help us to see things how they really are and to know things how they really are, not as they are perceived. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're helping us focus on on heavenly realities, not earthly realities. That we would see things from the place that you have 
put us, Jesus Christ, seated next to you in the heavenly realms, that we would we would begin to take on those perspectives from the place of victory, from the place of power, from the place of position and purpose and sonship in you. And I thank you, Lord, that you are stirring even in us this morning a supernatural confidence to embrace the pressure, embrace the shaking, knowing that your perfect faith and righteousness being worked out in us is bringing us into the place of wholeness on every side. I thank you, Lord, that in the promise in the shaking is that the unshakable things will remain. And so we yield ourselves to you. We declare our trust in you. We declare our confidence in you. We know that you are good. We've tasted and seen. Holy Spirit, move us right now into a place of response that we would we would respond with our finances. We would respond with our emotions. We would respond with our thought life. We would respond with our bodies. We would respond with our voice this morning to all that you have done and all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. of you have heard the analogy he is the potter and I am the clay it's used a lot and I'll tell you if you ever do any type of pottery you'll understand why it's used a lot because everything that you do in pottery relates to the spirit I've got two analogies for you it was one and then the Lord laid something else on me so um, when you are throwing pottery on the wheel your first step is to center that clay and if you don't center that clay, you will not successfully create a piece. It is one of the hardest, most crucial steps of throwing something on the wheel. You cannot continue until you center that clay and it can feel really frustrating. <laughs> but once you get that centered, you can create plates, bowls, cups, anything you want once it is centered. And as your pulling it upward and you're creating it into what it is sometimes it can get a little wobbly but if you start it out with it centered you can bring it back to that center and you can always pull it back to the center and this is why it's so important for us to start with our faith being centered in God because even when we waver even when we shake even when something knocks us out of line if we stay centered, we can always be brought back Amen. to that place. No matter what, whether you nick it with a tool and it scrapes through, you can always pull it back up and it's totally fine as long as you start with it centered. The second analogy is from my favorite type of glazing, and this is called Raku glazing. It's a very radical type of glazing, but it's very, very beautiful and by far my favorite. Um, but the way you raku glaze is you put the specific glaze on your piece and you superheat it to the point where it literally glows red from being so hot. And then you pull it straight from that hot place and thermoshock it into the air and then you close it and it catches fire. It is one of the most abrasive, risky, crazy, dangerous ways of glazing a piece but it creates the most beautiful results. But here's the thing is if you try and force it and do it on a day when uh, the barometric pressure is wrong, it's still gonna turn out beautiful, but it's gonna turn out all copper and nothing else. But if you allow yourself to be patient and wait through the process and you do it on a day when everything is where it's supposed to be, you can come out with a thousand different colors on one piece. Don't try and rush the process of your pressure in your own timing. You'll still end up beautiful, 
but you won't end up where he wants you to be. If you allow yourself to go in his timing, the thermo shock isn't going to risk breaking you. If you allow yourself to go with it and follow his timing and go with his, his pull and his way, you're going to end up with the most beautiful results that you couldn't even imagine could happen. More pottery analogies.
set me free. Oh, I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high, valley low, I sing out, remind my soul that I am yours. I'm forever becoming more and more convinced that we belong to God and that as Holly was just singing a minute ago that we cannot be separated from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and we're becoming fully convinced of this reality of Christ in us and us in Christ And if we allow ourselves to let the Holy Spirit bring us into the very depth and far-reaching effects of that, then we result in a declaration of I am yours. Not because I'm choosing, not because I'm upholding that relationship, but it's a relationship that's been done to me and done to you and they're the ones upholding the relationship. And, the, and in them upholding the relationship, this is what covenant does. It's not a contract that says, if you love me, I'll love you. It's a covenant that says that I will love you and I give myself fully to you without end, no matter if you reject me, no matter if you refuse to let my love do what it's designed to do, I'm going to continue to love. Here's here's the incredible thing about love. The love of God is irresistible. It's irresistible. Once we come face to face with love, and everybody will, once we come face to face with love, we'll be left with a choice again still of will I let that love actually love me? Will I let that love actually do what it's supposed to do? And we can continue in that tug of war until we will become. We will become. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess what? That he is Lord. Why? Not because he's going to be pushing them down, making them bow their knee, but because everyone will succumb to the love of God at some level. I know this is not a popular message and I know that there's a lot of churches that that think that this is unbiblical and but it's the way that Jesus actually demonstrated and lived his life. Yeah. It's it's the way that Jesus communicated 
the Father's love. It's the way that the Holy Spirit is designed to bring us into this. Okay, so I'm not trying to get way off track, but here's the thing is that when we understand this covenant love that's been done to us and the relationship that we are in, not because we're saying I'm there, not because we're saying I belong, not because, but because they are declaring over you, I know who you are. You belong to us. You were always in me. You were always a part of our life. You were always a part of our story. And nothing could ever tell you or convince you that you are not our son or daughter. Jesus didn't die on the cross to make you sons and daughters. Jesus died on the cross to show you that you are a son or a daughter. Jesus didn't die on a cross to, as a payment for our sins. Jesus t died on a cross because we killed him, because we didn't see him and we didn't see love and we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know. As a human race, we didn't know. As the church, as, as the early Jewish faith, they didn't know. They, the very, they were the ones that were supposed to recognize him and they didn't. And ultimately they killed him because he didn't fit their religious box of what they thought the son of God was supposed to look like. But it was our death and our murder and our darkness and our inability to see love that he actually submitted himself to for the purpose of love, for the purpose of the blinders coming off of our eyes to see right. love for, for in all its far-reaching, vast, deep, high, wide expressions out of Ephesians 3 like we talked about last week. So the point is for us to come into this place where we're allowing that love to actually draw us, to move us towards the reality of our oneness in them, in their relationship, in their perfect love, their perfect joy, their perfect peace into their knowledge of each other and their knowledge of us. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, which is the love chapter, where he's talking about maturing up into a place where I know as I am fully known. Where we know them as they know us. In the depths of their heart. Our beginning was in them. It wasn't in actually our, even our mother's womb. Ephesians 1 says that you were birthed in the Father's heart before the foundations of the earth. So here's what I want us to do in communion today is there is this place of drawing. There's a place where the Trinity is calling us to experience their closeness, to experience their comfort, to experience their touch, to experience their knowledge so that we can fully understand and yes we can fully understand as we move with them we get understanding Holy Spirit one of the Holy Spirit's names is a spirit of understanding okay so as we fully understand as we come into that knowledge we can actually be experiencing our inheritance we're not waiting for death we're not waiting for any of these things Jesus said, if anyone believes in me, they've already passed from death into life. There is no death. You're, we're just moving from life to life to life to life to life. So as we take communion today, I want to encourage us to allow the Holy Spirit to draw us. Take us to their heart. Take us to their perspective. Take us into their very life, the very life of Christ living inside of me. It's not outside of you. It's in you right now. The place isn't outside of this building. The place isn't in a different chair. It's inside of you. But allowing your, your inner person to be moved towards the desire of the Trinity for you. The desire of your Heavenly Father for you. The desire of your Savior Jesus Christ for you. The desire of the Holy Spirit to bring you into the fullness of glory. Allowing their love to completely captivate us and bring us into the place of awe and wonder. We have communion up front and we have it in the back and I encourage us all to just worship in communion.
I want to encourage you to just put your hand on your heart. <clears throat> At least one of them. And one of the ways that we can start being convinced of their life in us is simply asking Holy Spirit. And I'm going to have some, next week I'm going to have some prayers and things that we can begin praying that are relational in nature to draw us to the relationship in dwelling. But it's this simple question asking Holy Spirit, is, is Jesus inside of me? Is Christ in me? Holy Spirit, are you in me? And if you're struggling to hear, or struggling to know, or struggling to see, that means that there's something of darkness, some place where in your heart or in your life you experience being blinded from love, not, not knowing the love of God in an area of your life. And it can come through childhood trauma. It can come through any of those things. And, and, and the, the good news is that the Holy Spirit is there to, to help us walk out of that darkness, to walk out of those places of blindedness and, and to see the love that we are in. And so there's a, there's a very real place of conversation that we get to have with the Holy Spirit to become convinced of this reality. And it's designed to be the thing that captures us. It's designed to be the thing that holds our attention. Is, is this reality of Christ in me. It's designed to draw us out of whatever chaos or out of whatever distraction, out of whatever pain or fear that we might be having and coming back to this reality. That we were designed to live in, move in, and have our being in. This place of me in them and them in me. So we're going to move forward. I think Katie's going to hand out some. Uh, the Holy Spirit told me to print out all of my notes for you guys today. Because this is a big one. And it's, it's big in the area of understanding that we get to take responsibility for our relationship with Holy Spirit. And um, we've been talking about for the last few months about the personhood of Holy Spirit and that Jesus intended for us to become best friends with Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit was the greatest gift that the Father and the Son could give us. Jesus tells his disciples, I have to go because if I don't go back to the Father, the Holy Spirit won't come. And in that, in that conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples from John 14 through John 16, Jesus is redefining how all of humanity, and he's talking to his disciples, but he's talking about how the way that we as people, as created beings, as sons and daughters will relate to God. Jesus says, you will, because of your new relationship, say new relationship. Because of your new relationship, Jesus says, you will be able to pray for anything and it will be answered. That's a huge promise. 
That is, that is, think about that in nature. If you, if you wanted to get every single one of your prayers answered, there's a prerequisite to that, and it's friendship with the Holy Spirit. It's the deepening understanding of this intimate relationship that we were designed for. And so we've been talking about how do we build that relationship. And the first thing that we spent some time on in September was conversation. Just understanding that it takes time. Relationship takes time. And if we're not setting aside time for a relationship with the Holy Spirit, it, it's not, it's not going to happen. So there has to be intentional time that we set aside. And in the conversation, what we're actually learning to do is listen. You ever been around, and don't raise your hand, you ever been around a, a person that is always talking and you really kind of, you like, you want to build a relationship with this person, but they literally never stop talking. And, and it's, it's just this constant thing. And, and so they never take the opportunity to listen. In, in that relationship, there isn't really an opportunity for us to be known because they're doing all the talking. So think about that in the context of how we were taught prayer works. Prayer is you go into your prayer closet and you talk to God for a whole long time about all the things and all the problems and all the needs and all this stuff. And, and, and then you come out of your prayer, prayer closet expecting that God's going to answer all the things that you just talked to him about in the closet. The problem is, is that if we understand that prayer is actually conversation, there's a place where we probably need to be doing a lot more listening than we are talking. And so our, our first place is in conversation is actually learning how to listen. How many of you have on the opposite end had a friend that came into your life and they were such an amazing listener that you felt like they truly saw you and understood you simply because they were amazing at listening to you? I pray that every single one of you has had a friend like that. If you haven't had a physical friend like that, I want you to know you have a spiritual friend like that, the paracletos living inside of you. So when we, when we can become an excellent listener, we begin to understand their heart and their perspective and understand their reality and their truths and the things that makes them tick, makes them unique in the way that they see things, the way that they live life. So our first part is really about conversation. It was also about understanding that Holy Spirit doesn't necessarily speak English. As, as like, we, Jesus wasn't white and he didn't speak English. So we need to kind of get that American Jesus out of our mind, okay? We need to understand that language is a place of connection, but in the spirit, there's a completely different language, there's a universal language of love, and there's a language that is relational in nature. And so part of our process of understanding conversation is I want to learn how to speak their language. And some of that is learning how the Holy Spirit comes to convict us and convince us of these spirit realities and then giving our mouth to them and allowing the Holy Spirit to take hold of us. And we talked a lot about praying in the Spirit what that looks like. I, many times, Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 14. I pray with understanding, but then I pray without understanding. And, and it's not that I, he will never understand. It's just that in the moment, I'm letting the Holy Spirit bring me into a conversation that maybe I don't see all the ins and outs of, but I'm yielding myself to that relationship and that conversation. Everybody following? Everybody understanding? What, okay. Then we moved into, for the last few weeks, we've been talking about meditation. The things in our thought life and our mind and understanding that our thought life can keep us from either through distraction or through wrong perceptions can keep us from maintaining relationship with Holy Spirit or building relationship with Holy Spirit. And so this is where we understood and we taught Holly shared with everybody that that meditating we're all doing it but many of us are doing just meditating on the wrong thing because meditation is just when you have a thought for at least 30 seconds and you ruminate on that thought we all do it so what we want to do as a relational connection is we want to start meditating marinating on spirit realities on the life of the holy spirit who is the holy spirit and fixing our thoughts on heavenly realities not earthly realities we we had 
portions of scriptures that were pointing us towards our thought life, thinking that we get to intentionally think on things that would stir up relationship with Holy Spirit, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, you know, we that list of things. And going back even to the Isaiah where it talks about that those who's, uh, those uh, whose minds and imaginations are, are completely fixed on the Lord, they're the ones that are in perfect peace. And so we have to understand that our thoughts actually create. They, they take up mental real estate inside of our minds, and, and they, they pull us and move us. This was something that Holly and I talked about last week, about being moved in the wrong direction simply because your thoughts that can be rooted in all sorts of different things. It could be rooted in lies. It could be rooted in what we would call even good things, but are not God. Okay? And we can, we can be focused on all these things. Is it good to save your money? Yeah. But that could become a thing that you're constantly driven towards and focused on and meditating on. Is it good to spend time? So I'll, I'll be honest with me. In my life, I have such an amazing wife that it was hard for me to not constantly just meditate on her. Okay, cause she's good, man, and we have a great marriage, and it's awesome, and she's my best friend in the earth here, and I don't want to do anything apart from her, but I can allow that relationship to take up so much mental real estate. She's not my source. She's not my source of love. She's not my source of care. She's not my source. She is, she is a resource that God has given me to pour out on, but she is, she is in no way, shape, or form responsible for how I feel. So if I am meditating on that relationship, that can, that can become an idolatry. That can become a place where, where I'm now looking to her where I should be having a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You guys following? Yeah. Okay, so our meditation is something huge. And I'm actually going to partner because we're going to move into um, Paracletos Declaration today. And I'm going to use uh, a scripture out of Psalm 19, which was actually one of our scriptures in meditation I'm going to read Psalm 19, verse 14. It says this. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation thoughts, oh, and my meditation thoughts, and every movement of my heart be always pure and pleasing, acceptable before your eyes, Yahweh, my only redeemer, my protector. So I want to make a connection between our words and our thoughts today. And I, I want us to look at, this is a really, really, really huge area. And if you'll let the Holy Spirit convict you in this area, and if you'll let the Holy Spirit have lordship in this area, I promise you, you can have a 2025 that will blow your absolute live in mind. Because we, we need to have an understanding of the depths of the power and the depths of influence that our words and our tongue have. So in our journey with the Lord, as we were growing around 2009, we were in a, in a major squeezing season. This was a pressure season. This was, God, we don't know what to do. We don't know what you're doing. We don't know where to go. We don't know how to stand. And so as a ministry team, we went over to Klamath Falls just to take some time to listen to the Lord. And the thing that we came out of that time with the Lord for about three days up on the mountain is the Lord was telling us that we needed to give him our tongue. And one of the things that he was telling us was that you have great faith. You're saying yes to everything I'm doing, but your mouth is speaking faithlessness. Your mouth is speaking problem. Your mouth is speaking lack. Your mouth is speaking sickness. Your mouth is actually defeating the very faith that's worked inside of it. Your mouth is defeating my purposes and my plans and my promises for you. And I need you to stop. Because I really want amazing things, but you need to understand that I've given you authority and, I, and this world I've given to humanity and it gets to go how you speak. Jesus says you have what you say. You have what you say. Okay, so in the, okay, let me back up a little bit because this became a religious thing for me. And, and it's okay if it starts there, but it can't stay there. 
So for some of you, this will just be a religious thing for a little bit. But it's designed to move you with, and you can get a way head start because I didn't understand Holy Spirit as a relational being. I didn't understand the purpose of Holy Spirit living inside of me other than Jiminy Cricket on my shoulder trying to keep me behaving the right way. And so then, then it kind of moved us into this like word of faith movement. How many of you have been around that or understood that? Okay, so the word of faith movement, the problem with that in the church has been it was like a slot machine. I can, I can speak the right thing and I can partner with a force, okay, in the world that God put out there, I could partner with a force and I can cause things to happen with what I say. This is absolutely a true thing and it is a spiritual law because your tongue is a creative force. It, it continues to create everything that you say. It's not just creating at one time. It goes out, the same voice that created the heavens and the earth, the same voice that shaped the universe. Guess what's happening to our universe? It's continually expanding. It has been, they now, they've proven this with science that the universe is always expanding, always going out. See, here's the thing is that God speaks and it's of love's kind and love is always going out. It's always going out and producing after its kind. So our words are the same way. How did God create? Did he, he spoke it. You're, you and I are made in the image and likeness of God. Therefore, the words that we speak create. And many of us, as myself included, for most of our life, have created the very thing we hate with our words. So let me talk about a little bit about what this religious thing is. So we thought this was just like, I just need to say the right things at the right time in the right ways so that I get what I want. So I get the results that I want. And that's kind of the word of faith belief. And some of that is true. I will tell you that the New Age movement is doing this all the time. It's called manifesting, okay? So when they're, they'll, they'll make a dream board and they'll put it up on the wall and they'll have pictures and then they'll speak into it every day. What are they doing? They're just partnering with a spiritual law. And they'll get what they want. They understand that we have the power to create. We are co-missioned with God. We are co-creators with God. We are doing everything together with them. And there is a power and a life source living inside of us that is actually where we get life from. The problem is, is that many of us can create darkness with the very thing that we were supposed to create light and love with. And so later on, when I understood that my words, yes, they were the process of the starting of the renewing of my mind. And, and I will tell you that there was about six months where we were religiously holding each other accountable as a ministry. Where we were not letting anything come out of our mouth that was not life-giving or full of love or faith or hope or provision or anything like that. And so even when we would slip up, there would be times like, hey, do, uh, do you want to create that? Is that really the reality you want to create? Because I think that you want to create a different reality, right? Okay. And then we would hold each other accountable, and then we learned how, and even wrote a little booklet called Speak Life, where we took the scriptures, the word of God, the promises of God, the truths of God, and many of you have even put this into practice and experienced your own transformation at a level from the words that you speak. But I want us to get a major upgrade in this area. Because I want us to understand this is not just about, uh, first of all, I want to I tell you where the little disappointment and the secret little thing that happens when we're trying to just see this as a place of, oh, I can just create what I want with my words. The problem is, is that when something doesn't happen the way that you spoke it to happen, guess what happens? All this judgment and all this stuff start happening where it's like, oh, I didn't say it enough times or I forgot today to say it. And, oh, I didn't say it the right way. I didn't use the right word. And, oh, then I, then uh, God must be mad at me. I've got sin in my life. He's not hearing me. And so if I have sin, he's not going to hear my prayers. And if I've got unforgiveness, he's not going to hear my prayers. And we take, and all of a sudden we start getting absolutely beat up by the spirit of religion and all of these processes because we're not understanding the nature of what we were invited to, to partner with our mouth. Great. Oh, to, yeah, judgment, yeah. 
hundred percent. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah, hundred percent. So we need to scratch all that. If you've ever felt that, you need to kind of throw that out with yesterday's trash. Okay, and that needs to go away. And you can say things like, "I unbelieve that right now," in Jesus' name. I unbelieve that. So let's come back to some of the foundational things that we know now. We know God is a relational God. We know that he is love and nothing other. And we know that he is always for us and never against us. And we know that he has fully given himself to us, both spirit, son, and father, to us, to bring us into the reality of who we are. That means that anything that we would say is meant to bring us towards a relational connection with God, not just a provision. Because there's a lot of people out there getting their needs met that don't know God. I'm going to say that again. There's a lot of people out there getting their needs met that don't know God. And when I'm talking about knowing God, I'm not talking about belief in God. They absolutely believe God. They could probably quote more scriptures than you know. And yet they do not know God. So what we have to do is we have to understand that anything that I'm doing with my words is connected to and designed to create a space of intimacy and relationship with God. Therefore, the words that I speak will either create connection with God or disconnection with God. In other words, Proverbs 18 says life or death. So here's what I want us to understand and this is i want to encourage a couple things one of them is get yourself an accountability partner you're going to need help to do this and and you're going to have to humble yourself to be able to hear when you don't want to hear when you're feeling when you're just letting it fly and you're just spewing crap out of your mouth because your feelings are all up in a roar and you're giving yourself permission to just verbally vomit all over the atmosphere is humbling yourself and allowing someone to come in and say, I don't think that you want to create that. I, I don't think that I don't I don't think that you want. So we don't necessarily want to talk about being in agreement with that, because then that would say that that I'm against you if you're going to talk that way. We don't want to do that. What we're going to say is we're going to encourage that person and say, you know what? I, I think that you want to create something different. I understand that you're really struggling right now. I understand. So this is going to this isn't just willy nilly, you know, p pick your coworker if you know, we see each other in the break room every, you know, two hours. But I, I want you to think about who is a trusted person that knows your heart and is willing to walk you through this and be held accountable. And, and understand that, that it's, it's a humbling thing to have someone be able to talk to you and tell you, hey, I, I want to encourage you to, to just stop talking right now. I want to encourage you to create something else. So we're going to be working towards building relationship with Holy Spirit based on how we speak. So let's come back to, if we're going to know how to speak, we have to look at who Holy Spirit is again. And I just spent some time, and this is not an exhaustive, huge list. There's much more here, but I just want us to come back and look at who Holy Spirit is, the personhood of Holy Spirit. We know that in perichoresis, that the triune God is one, okay? They are one. You cannot separate them. And yet they each have their own personification. So, th so they're perfectly one without losing their own individual character traits and things that, that bring to the relationship of the oneness. Everybody understand that? And so there are things in the Son and there are things in the Father and there are things in the Holy Spirit that absolutely bring definition to their personality and bring definition to who they are and what they contribute to the relationship. But at the same time, they are all exactly one and equal with each other and mutually indwelling. Okay. You cannot separate. At no time was the Son ever separated from the Father or the Holy Spirit. At no time was the Holy Spirit ever separated from the Father and the Son. At no time was the Father ever separate from the Holy Spirit or His Son, Jesus. That was one of the foundational things that the early church wanted to make very, very clear. And it was the foundation of the gospel in the first 300 years of the church. And most people don't understand that because once you understand perichoresis and all things exist in this, and this is what defines life, that defines everything. 
and it, find, it defines who we are because we're in it. Not by our, we didn't walk into it. We didn't, no, they put us in the middle of them. Okay, Holy Spirit, the parakletos. We've talked about this word that John uses. John's the only one that uses this name. But John is speaking about this from a very deep understanding of who Holy Spirit is in him. And, and the word in the Aramaic literally is the parakleta, which means the one who comes to end the curse in your life. He's also called the divine encourager, divine comforter, uh, another friend or another savior, as John uh, says. Holy Spirit is the intercessor. He is the fire of God. The Holy Spirit is the power. He is the living water, the breath of God, the spirit of life, the spirit of God. Holy Spirit is the spirit of Christ, the spirit of truth, who speaks truth over us. Holly mentioned that, that that's the double-edged sword. It's, it's not just us speaking truth out of our mouth. It's actually us receiving the truth spoken to us by the Holy Spirit and then comes out of our mouth. That's a relational thing, guys receiving from the Holy Spirit, and then speaking. That's the double-edged sword, okay? That's the sword of the Spirit, okay? Uh, Holy Spirit is the spirit of sonship and adoption. That word adoption is weosithia, which means placement. It does not mean paperwork. The sp uh, Holy Spirit is the spirit of glory, the spirit of promise, the spirit of extraordinary wisdom, the spirit of perfect understanding, the spirit of wisdom uh, and wise strategy, the spirit of mighty power, the spirit of revelation, the spirit of the awe of Yahweh. Those last handful are out of uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, where it's, prop it's actually one of the messianic prophecies that Isaiah has of Jesus. And in verse 2, it talks about that the spirit of Yahweh would be upon the Messiah, and, and that spirit would produce these things and be these things in Christ. Okay, so in relationship with Holy Spirit, we need to recognize that Holy Spirit is other-centered, outgoing love. That's agape love. Holy Spirit is, not just produces, Holy Spirit is joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, gentle, and secure. And that's where I want us to understand that, that uh, many translations calls that sound mind or self-control. I will tell you that when you know you're secure, you're self-controlled. That, that self-control is not something you do with your own will and your own muscle. Self-control is not by your might, but by the Spirit's might. Okay? So, and the Spirit is strong and confident because the Spirit is secure. The same way Christ was secure and is secure in the love of his Father. Holy Spirit is truth-centered. Holy Spirit is life-focused and is always positive, encouraging, and uplifting. Now, that sounds like the very best friend that we could ever have. You want to add something? Yep. Right. Yeah, it's a flip, flip thing. Yep. Yeah, it's kind of like the love and obedience thing. I was taught that if I love God, I'll obey his commands. So then every time I messed up, it would then define to me, the spirit of religion would tell me, well, then you don't love God. But I do love God. <laughs> and I have so much more in my life that proves that I do love God. So here's the thing is that it actually reads and is translated in the original language. It actually says, Jesus says, when you love me, you'll obey my commands. Not if, when. And John helps define that by in 1 John 4 where it says it's not that you love God, but God loves you first. Okay, so there's a prerequisite to all of this movement. There's, there's, I have to receive the love of God in order to reciprocate the love of God in order to live in obedience. Do you see that? I have to receive the love of God in order to reciprocate the love of God. And by loving God, I will automatically obey the things that he's telling me to do. Obedience is actually a byproduct of a loving relationship. Think about that. In the place of intimacy, and I've used this, I use Holly and I's marriage, I don't have to think about not cheating on my wife. I don't have to think about not yelling at her. I don't have to think about sinning against her because of the intimate relation that we have. I naturally want to delight her and please her and give her everything. My natural inclination is to put her first. 
not because I'm trying to, but because we have 26 years of intimate friendship and relationship and history together where we've wrestled things out together. And we haven't done it perfect, but I will tell you that we've paved the ground that I'm not having to think about how I'm going to respond to her in order to make sure that she knows I love her. I'm constantly living in that natural response of the love that's already inside of me for her. Yes, Reggie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. When I yield myself to the place of love, I yield myself to the other person. That's what God does with us. God yields himself to us at great cost to himself and continues to yield and continues to yield and continues to yield Simply, simply so that we can know love. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Okay, so here's why I want us to transition a little bit. Our words determine the company we keep. Yeah. I'm going to say that again. Our words determine the company we keep. What you say will determine the people and the places and the nature of where you're hanging out and what you're hanging out with. All of us can understand there's, there's people, and I, again, I'm not trying to pick on people, but all of us know when we're being annoyed by another person. All of us know when we've experienced someone, you're just like, man, I just can't be around that person. They just, they're yapping about things. They're negative Nancy all the time. They're just, everything is, you know, everything is politics or everything is, you know, about them or everything is them bragging about what they got to do or, you know, they're just those people that are just like, man, you are, I, I don't even want to be around you because of the way that you talk. But guess what? They have their own circles. They have their own people that they hang out with, and that's how they talk. And the reason that you don't want to hang out with that person is because you've decided in your life, that isn't how I want to be. I don't want to talk like that. And so you're going to find your own circle that says, hey, we can talk about things and edify each other and encourage one another. But I would tell you that, that negative people will find other negative people to be around. But positive people will find other positive people to be around. People that speak life will find others that speak life and decide to do life and and exchange with them. So there's this place that we need to understand that this happens in the spirit realm as well. If I am speaking negatively, what company am I keeping? Because I'm not keeping the spirit of God. That my, I actually empower the demonic and the darkness by the things that I say. And that becomes my company. When I'm deciding to be negative, when I'm deciding to live off fear, when I'm deciding to live off, off nagging and negativity and lack and I don't have and this isn't working out and nothing works out and when we partner with frustration, when we partner with all those things, when we're doing that, when we're feeding on, it starts in the mind, we're feeding on those and then we begin talking that out. Let me tell you, the enemy is using you as his creator. The enemy is not a creator, but he will use your creative ability to create his own way. And the tool he will use is your mouth. Starts in the thoughts, comes out of the mouth. So we need to understand a few things. We know that the tongue is a creative force. This is this is science. It's not even just scripture. It's science. They know that when you, how many of you heard of the, the water with the crystals and all that kind of things? Like they did a science project over in Japan where they took water. It was supposed to be the purest water in Japan. They bottled it all up. They put it and they subject it to these different atmospheres. And so one of the atmospheres, they just spoke life and beauty and love and everything and everything. And it formed these amazing crystals and unique and glorious and beautiful. And then they, in the, in another, in another study, they took the water and they spoke death and, and hatred and, and evil and all these things and, uh, negativity to it. And it wouldn't form crystals. It, w- it only, it was like cloudy and gray. It changed the color of the water, changed you know, all of those different things. Holly and I actually did this with our children as uh, uh, in our own house with rice. 
and we made a bunch of rice. We put it in three different jars, and we told the kids, we want you to know the power of your tongue. We want you to know that what you speak creates. How you talk to your sister or your brother creates something. And so we, in one place of our house, we had them go, and they would speak life to that uh, rice. And in another house, they, uh, part of the house, they would go and they would speak uh, negativity. They were, they were able to, to say the S word. They, were, they told the rice to shut up. Okay, because we didn't allow that word in our house, okay? So, and then one, Caitlin did this the best. One, we wanted them to understand what happens when someone is just completely shunned. And so she, Caitlin would walk by and goes, I shun you, okay? And, and so one of them, we just, we wanted them to, to understand the power of, of being completely outcast or pushed away. And I will tell you, if you want to do this, we did it for 30 days. The rice that they spoke life to turned almost like this goldish hue, and it smelled like rice wine. It was beautiful. It was amazing. Um, We did not eat it, but it was, anyways, it didn't stink at all. Oh, thanks, Holly, for bringing up that stuff. So then um, the, the, Right away, within a couple weeks, the rice that they were speaking death to got all pussy and, like, black and moldy and everything. Same jars, same rice, same everything, just what we spoke to it. And then the one that um, that was shunned was, like, got all nasty and bubbly and cloudy and very— and it, and it actually stunk the worst. Out of all, it literally smelled like death. It was horrible. And the lid fell off one time when we were using it at, uh, at one of our Elevate Recovery, our, our Elevate meetings, and it stunk. It drove everybody out of the church, guys. That's one little jar of rice caused everybody to run. Okay, so your words are powerful. Take them seriously. Not just sometimes. This becomes a place where, I, actually, I wasn't even aware, and I can guarantee that most of you aren't either, of the words that come out of your mouth. Most of us are completely unaware that we're speaking death, that we're speaking curses, that we're speaking, and we're undoing the very thing that God wants us to do. Because we've been, we've been trained and bent in a negative, fear-based, lack-based type of reality. And we speak from that. We mumble it under our breath. When we don't like somebody, we're cursing them with our mouth underneath our breath. When someone cuts us off in traffic, hallelujah. Okay. I want us to understand that life and death are in the power of the tongue. That's Proverbs eighteen twenty one. James says that it's the most dangerous part of your body. In James chapter 3, we're going to read that in a minute. And Jesus himself said that this is, again, a heart issue. So we've recognized that in the relationship placed with Holy Spirit, in every place we've come to this understanding that it's a heart issue. That my being willing to to listen to the Holy Spirit and give time to the Holy Spirit is a heart issue. My willingness to fixate my thoughts and meditate on things that are pure and loving, that's a heart issue. And the words coming out of my mouth are a heart issue. Jesus connected the fruit of our life as evidenced by the words we speak. I'm going to say it again. Jesus connected the fruit of our life as evidenced by the words that we speak. Let me read this to you out of Luke chapter 6. For the overflow of what has been stored in your heart will be seen by your fruit and will be heard in your words. I love the Mirror Study Bible translates this. One's conversation exhibits whatever it is that has your full attention and captivates your gaze. Ooh, listen to this again. One's conversation, what we speak, exhibits whatever it is that has our full attention and captivates our gaze. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 11. What truly contaminates a person is not what he puts into his mouth, but what comes out of his mouth. What, uh, that's what makes people defiled. Jump down to verse 17 and 18. It says, it, is it hard to understand that whatever you eat enters the stomach only to pass out into the sewer? But what comes out of your mouth reveals the core of your heart. Words can pollute, not food. So, how do we change the way that we speak? How do we 
stop that negative progression? What do we do? And I, I, uh, I want us to understand today that the spirit of wisdom and revelation has been given to us, right? Yeah. Ephesians 1, verse 17. The spirit of wisdom and revelation. Paul prays for us in that prayer. He's wanting us to have the spirit of wisdom, re, wisdom and revelation. Why? To know. Again, this comes back to knowing God, knowing the Holy Spirit, knowing Christ for who they really are. So wisdom transforms the heart and our word words. I have a little typo there. Wisdom transforms the heart and our words. Wisdom comes to speak something other. Wisdom comes to define something other. Wisdom is God's thoughts, not your thoughts. Okay, these are simple kind of redefining. Wisdom is not smarts. It's not knowledge uh, in the way that we would obtain knowledge. So wisdom in God's perspective is not knowing a bunch of scripture. It's knowing the author. Okay, that, that's how we're going to define wisdom. Wisdom leads us into the place of revelation. If we don't understand who the author is, we can't receive what he has for us. We, when he uncovers it, we're not going to see it or value it for what it is because we don't know the one who's giving it to us. So this, again, is all relational in context. Am I losing you? Are, are we following along? Okay. So in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is all throughout the Old Testament. So is Christ. But there's some really big, big portions of Scripture that talk about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And how many of you have ever done uh, the Proverbs a day kind of reading type thing? Okay, there's 31 Proverbs. It's, excuse me, it's very uh, popular to, you know, read a proverb a day. I want you to know that the entire book of Proverbs is about the Holy Spirit. It is the book of wisdom. And Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom. So, wisdom... And again, this is where kind of we talked about this, that, that, that uh, anytime it talks about the Holy Spirit, it's always gender neutral. It's not, and many, the, the Ruach, which is the spirit wind uh, name for Holy Spirit, is actually feminine. And so there's a lot of connotation that the, the work of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, embodies much of the feminine and feminine traits and qualities. Um, and so in, in, Solomon's Proverbs, he talks about wisdom as a female. She, right? Have we, have we listened? Have we read Proverbs? All right, if not, you need to. Okay, so <laughs> Proverbs talks a ton about the tongue and words. So let's just go through a bunch of these. Proverbs ten nineteen: too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. Ha! <laughs> Proverbs 10, 31, the mouth of the, ungod of the godly person gives wise wisdom, but the tongue that deceives will be cut off. Proverbs 12, 14, wise words bring many benefits. Proverbs 12, 18, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 13, 3, the one who guards his mouth preserves his life. The one who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. Proverbs 15, 2, the tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of fools pour out folly. Proverbs 15, 4, a gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Proverbs 15, 28, the heart of the godly thinks carefully before speaking. Proverbs 16, 24, gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Proverbs 17, 27, he who restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Proverbs 21, 23, watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut, and you will stay out of trouble. Proverbs 25, 11, like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. Love that one. Proverbs 25, 25, like cold water to a weary soul is good news from a distant land. 
Proverbs 29, 20. Do you see a man who is hasty with his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Proverbs 31, 26. When she speaks, her words are wise and she gives instruction with kindness. I want us, if there's anything we walk away with today, I want us to let the Holy Spirit tur- stir up a conviction for the way that we speak. And that, if anything, if we become anything, let us become aware of the words that are coming out of our mouth. Our words determine the direction we move towards. I'm going to say this again. Our words determine the direction we move towards. We're either going to move towards love or away from love, which would be fear. We're either going to move towards Holy Spirit or we're going to move away, which is towards the self-life. So our words will determine where we go. I'm going to read this out of James chapter 3, starting in verse 2. It says this, We all fail in many areas, but especially with our words. Yet if we're able to bridle the words we say, we are powerful enough to control ourselves in every way. Did you listen to that? Yet if we were able to bridle the words we say, we are powerful enough to control ourselves in every way. And that means our character is mature and fully developed. Horses have bits and bridles in their mouths so that we can control and guide their large body. And the same with mighty ships, though they are massive and driven by fierce winds, yet they are steered by a tiny rudder at the direction of the person at the helm. And so the tongue is a small part of your body, yet it carries great power. Just think of how a small flame can set a huge forest ablaze, and the tongue is a fire. It can be compared to the sum total of wickedness and is the most dangerous part of our human body. It corrupts the entire body and is a hellish flame. It releases a fire that can burn throughout the course of human existence. For every wild animal on the earth, including birds, creeping reptiles, and creatures of the sea and land, have all been overpowered and tamed by humans, but the tongue is not able to be tamed. It's a fickle unrestrained evil that spews out words full of toxic poison. We use our tongue to praise God our Father and then turn around and curse a person who was made in his very image. Out of the same mouth we pour out words of praise one minute and curses the next. My brothers and sisters, this should never be. Now James is a harsh dude. I love James. James is the brother of Jesus, but man, that guy, he... I don't know, you, you, you had to really like James to sit through one of his sermons. So, But here's the thing, he's speaking truth here, and he's wanting us to understand, and this has been a problem in the church from the beginning. Yeah. It has been the thing that has destroyed, absolutely destroyed the Spirit of God moving in the church. And it's not just how we talk. It's in the way that we talk. It's the gossip we gossip. It's the negativity we produce. It's the backbiting and and the things that we do um, to other people, about other people. And that's one of the things that Holly and I and all of our leadership has really tried to be really, really on top of. We will not allow gossip. We will not allow. And if we hear about it, we're, uh, you know, we're going to come talk to you in love with gentleness, but we're going to talk to you and let you know that isn't how we do things. That's not how we're going to talk and we're not going to put each other down. We're not going to gossip each other about each other behind each other's back. And we're, that's just not what we do in no way, shape or form. We don't do it. And so we're, we're going to protect relationship. We're going to protect that every single one of us is a child of God and deserves that respect to, uh, to be honored with our words. Whether you agree with them or not, doesn't matter. And so I want um, to encourage us as we move forward in through this month. We're going to be talking all month about the tongue. We're going to be talking all month about how to work towards. And I would love to have testimonies by the end of this month. I would love to have testimonies of how your life has changed simply because of the way you started talking and maybe stopped talking in some areas. So <clears throat> there, there's an opportunity for us to all get a radical upgrade. Amen? 
And so here's some, I, I, we talk about this all the time. I will tell you, I carried around, Holly carried around. Holly had three by five cards posted up all over our house. They were inside every cabinet, inside a refrigerator, on the bathroom mirror. They were every, they were in our closet. They were above our bed. And she posted three by five cards all around the house to keep her accountable to the things that she was speaking. And so as she would interact with the areas of the house, she would declare when she'd open a cabinet she'd speak life and speak love and speak what God was wanting to do and I would encourage you to do the same thing I I would carry stacks of three by five cards in my pocket until they shredded and became nothing from sweat and friction but and then I would write some more and what I was doing was I was taking declarations yes some of them were scripture but not all of them some of them were just promises of God some of them were declarations I was making over myself what was I doing I'm just creating space for connection with the Lord and making sure that the things I'm coming out that are coming out of my mouth are actually going to move me towards relationship with Holy Spirit and not away from it now, God will always pursue us. So even if you've got negativity coming out of your mouth, I want you to know you're not pushing God away. You're just choosing to not participate with the right conversation. So God is not against you when you are, when you are creating death with your words. And I've done that. I've created death with my words. God is never against us for that. But he is calling us into the place of relationship. And this is a major area that most of the world has not taken ownership of and that's their own mouth and they allow cursing to come out of their mouth and they allow these things to uh, to be a normal part of life uh, and we had people that would come to us and when we would challenge them on what they say well i just speak reality i just speak the truth i just well that's not a truth that you probably want to be a part of but uh, but and you get what you say. So if that's what you want, if you just want to speak the reality that you're feeling and you're experiencing, and, and you can get that, and you can have more of that. But if you would like something different, would you like something different? If you would like something different, you can have something different, but it's going to start with what you're doing with your mouth. Do you want to say something, Gina? Yeah. My mom always talked about speaking the truth and reminding people of things that they need to hear. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And so... Right. She's with the Lord, though, and and that's not the end of things. And so we're but we do get these opportunities to recognize that. Yeah. OK. We now know that 87 to 98 percent of all physical, mental and emotional sickness, illness in the body comes from your thought life and what's coming out of your mouth. So I got Ron and then Jacob. Yeah. Yep. Take him. Sure. Yeah. Obviously, God has sent his word to heal you. And so we want to partner with that. Again, this is not a recipe. So I, I want us to not get caught up in the religiousness of, well, I want health. So I'm just going to speak health. Health is a relational thing, guys. And so we, we have to come back to letting the lordship of the Holy Spirit have lordship over our body. And, and if some of you are going through physical things, that, is not, it, that does not determine your reality with relationship with the Holy Spirit. Okay? And so we don't, we don't dictate our reality based on what's going on in our body. But we can affect what's going on in our body, first of all, by how relationally we're staying connected to the Trinity and what's coming out of our mouth. Yes, Christopher. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That. Right. Sure. Yeah. No, that's also. Yes, brother. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So here's what I want us to do. Anything that we're doing with our mouth or anything that, I, again, I want us to stay focused on the relational aspect because that's what we're, I will tell you that if this is the one thing that God is drawing 
his entire bride to is back into right relationship. We have not had a right relationship with God in, in, as a church, as a whole, in probably at over 1,700 years. Okay, there, things were getting messed up right out the get-go. And so we, we want to be those people that are answering the call of the Holy Spirit to draw us back into that relational place. Amen? And we get to do that partnering with our mouth. Let's go ahead and stand up. I'm going to go ahead and pray. For those of you that can stay for our lunch and stuff, I'm going to go ahead and pray over that as well. Um, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of food for anybody uh, that wants to participate. If I could get some guys after we're done praying that or gals, that would like to help set up tables and chairs uh, in the back. That'd be great. And um, let's uh, let's stretch out our hands and declare over each other and declare of the day. The Lord blesses you and keeps you. The Lord smiles down on you and shows you his kindness. The Lord answers your prayers and gives you his peace. The Lord covers you with his name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Today is fun and powerful. Be blessed. Thank you, Lord, for the food. Amen.